kind of hanging out there. So now the webinar is now broadcasting. Okay. Uh, so anyone that wants to join can join. Um, so let's see who pops up. I'm going to go to participants right now. It's just us. I didn't, I checked my emails and I didn't see anyone. But I spoke with Donald today. So we said 530. This pause. Okay. Thank you. Donald. Okay, I've started the recording. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. So getting to know each other. So this is our uh, first round of three uh, where we begin our conversation today. Um, so what we will do in our getting to know each other round, round one, we, each participant will take one to two minutes to answer one of the following questions. So the questions that we have here today are, what are your hopes and concerns for your family, community, and our country? What would your best friend say about who you are? And three, what sense of purpose, mission, duty, or duty guides you in your life? Anyone can, can begin. <laughs> Let me take the first question we are on mind. What are your hopes and concerns for your family, community, and our country? I think uh, my hopes for the country is the ability to accept dissent in a way that's respectful, in a way to understand that different people, different communities uh, come from a different angle, but they all do it for the love of country or family or community. So the challenge that I've been seeing uh, is that uh, unfortunately uh, in this day and age, we have got so polarized, we always believe that there is only one way to get things done. And more on, often than not, we've heard the old adage which says that there are, there are many ways to roam. Similarly, there are many ways to reach our goal, which is a better tomorrow for us, for our family, for our community and our country. So that is basically what my hope is. My fear is that many times we actually stop listening because we're only talking. And so it's very important for us not to just hear, but actually listen. And maybe when we start listening, we will begin to realize that there is so much out there that, is, that we don't know and that we can all benefit by. Kimberly? Okay. Um, I'm going to take the second question. What would my best friend say about who I am? Um, I'll include my sister as my best friends as well, but um, when it comes to listening or the title that I've received actually is that I'm a quiet storm. Um, <laughs> I have been told that I, I'm a good listener because I am quiet. Uh, I'm quiet for a reason. I, I sometimes um, pause and I kind of had a, have a little bit of a stutter. So because of my older sister always speaking for me, and I blame it on her. <laughs> um, but anyways, so I feel like I've, I'm a listener, but I also um, let people tell me their stories instead of um, me jumping in and, and comparing to uh, their story to my own experience. I, I'm kind of an introspective person. Um, so that's a little bit about who I am. I, I feel like um, I've my listening skills are good, but I'm still working. I'm developing my speaking skills. And this forum gives me that opportunity. So that's just a, a, you know, a little bit about who I am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next. Yes, hi. Um, oh. oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Nick. OK. Um, thanks. I will do the uh, what sense of purpose, mission, duty guides you in your life. Um, I think everyone should have a sense of purpose and, and a mission. I think uh, we, we shouldn't go about life uh, just willy-nilly. We should have a goal and we should have guiding principles. Um, and, and for me in particular, I think, um, I, believe that we're, I believe that I'm here to work. I'm, I'm here to serve, which can also be interpreted as assisting or helping others. 
and um, I'm also here to respect. So I, I think that uh, th those three belief systems for me, it, it, it has gotten me to where I am now. And uh, it has allowed me to, um, uh, for example, when I feel overwhelmed with work, I tell myself, well, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to work. Uh, when I feel that, uh, that someone needs my help, my assistance, I don't think, oh, I'm just giving out too much of myself, but I realize that this is what I'm here for. This is my purpose in life. I'm here to serve. And uh, as a branch group administrator, I'm, I'm here to work for my for the branch managers that that are actually, I'm working for them. Um, and I also feel that um, by respecting people, uh, it's easy not to offend people and it makes it easier not to offend people and then be respectful and just being respectful to people. You're being more sensitive to, to who they are and, and, and to the human being that is there in front of you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Nick? I'll, um, I'll jump in because just, I, my, maybe my missions aren't as good as Meg's, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I do have, I, I, I have a motto, um, and that's, that's not, it's not the same as the mission, but I kind of think they're linked together, so I do have, my father always taught me that you should try to leave something better off than you found it, um, it's something he's always said, he's usually talking about gardening or building or something like that, but <laughs> it applies to everything. Um, and then also I just kind of lead my life with that in mind, but then also uh, to, to not be afraid. Because, you know, I really do feel like we don't know what the next day is going to bring. So mm -hmm. if you have a chance to experience something or to connect, uh, try not to let fear be what traps you or holds you back from doing that. And I think those two principles kind of help me get through life most days. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. Mm -hmm. Nick? Um, so I think that I am going to answer what my best friend would say about who I am. Um, one, I think that my best friend would say I was empathetic, passionate, and a loner. Um, yeah. So, you know, and, and when I say a loner, it's, 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 it, 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 it's coupled with, with both of those other things. Um, I'm the individual that may have a friend for three, four years, you know, and maybe life just gets out of, you know, hand and I don't speak to them for three or four years. But mm -hmm. once we do speak to one another, it's like we've never stopped. Um, and I have a bunch of friends like that. And they all know that that's just me. Um, that though they don't hear from me regularly, they know that my heart's still there. I still think about them. And, um, you know, it, it pretty much sums up. And, and a lot of that, you know, I think the, the empathy and the passion are what allow me to be able to do that. You know, that I, I know that life happens and they know that life happens for me. And so they are accepting of what I, you know, how I am. And, but they know that they're always there and I'm always thinking about them. Um, so, you know, that, I think that would best describe who I am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next. Well, thank you. Well, Victor, you stole everything that was on my <laughs> list. Uh, so uh, I'll expand a little bit more uh, with that as well. And, and certainly I, um, I, I am ex in, in an introvert, an introverted, but when I'm at work, I'm extroverted. Uh, and I think um, Sometimes that's very exhausting. And if you're an introvert and you have to be extroverted, mm. that really drains you. And so th that's me. Uh, so when I get in my car and I drive my eight miles home from work, that's my downtime. And it gives me a chance to, uh, to you know, refresh myself. Um, uh, and so uh, certainly my wife, I think my family, my friends would, would say I'm introverted. They would say I'm passionate. They would say that uh, I'm a loner as well, too. I, I have no problem going to a movie all by myself. And sitting in that movie theater by myself, I have no problem going to a restaurant and sitting down and eating lunch or dinner by myself uh, as well, too. And, and there's, um, there's nothing to be afraid about that. Uh, I think some people can be afraid of, of, of doing things like that. And I don't, I don't think that's, that's needed. Um, uh, I would also say that uh, I, 
I, I want to try to be a, a good example for my children uh, and uh, to help help them live uh, a servant leadership life and, and to learn uh, how to do that and to how to um, uh, grab something that they're passionate about, something that they want to enjoy and, and live that to the fullest and be that to the fullest as well, too. So I think that's a passion part for me as well. And I, I, I try to do that with my nephews and nieces as well, too. I don't see them frequently. I see they're 600 miles away, but I try to text them weekly to check in with them um, because I didn't have that when I was growing up with uh, my aunts and uncles and my family. Since my, my family was away with my dad in the Navy, we did not see our family. And so I don't see them, but I can certainly be in contact with them. So that's me. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I aspire to be you all. <laughs> so I, I'm not there yet. Uh, I can totally connect with Todd. Um, I'm extremely introverted. Uh, so I could definitely um, connect with the kind of the exhaustion of having to extrovert like when you're totally introverted most of the time. Um, I think the question that I will answer is what will your best friends say about uh, who you are? And what's interesting about that, since the theme of this conversation is about listening, uh, I do not have one friend that has ever told me that I am a good listener. <laughs> so this is like a moment of reflection. Um, and I, as we move through this conversation, I'll really be evaluating uh, kind of this, the elements of listening and the importance of that in conversation and relationship building. You know, I think that's the other piece of this too. Uh, so, so yes, I, I've been told I am kind uh, and caring, but uh, no one has ever told me uh, that I am a good listener. <laughs> uh, so there, there's definitely opportunity for growth in, in this conversation today. Um, so has everyone had the opportunity uh, to, to speak and, and to, to, we all have a sense that we've gotten to know each other a little more? Yes. Awesome. Yes. All right, so in exploring the topic, um, so this is round two, we've entered round two of the dialogue. And of, and of course, the conversation today um, stems from two themes. So one, listening courageously, and then the other is talking across the color line. So we'll, we'll dig into the video that accompanies uh, the dialogue for today. So let me introduce the topic for you. Um, so there are the two elements as I discussed. So we're really here to discuss the listening and the transformative conversation. So I wanted to begin by just discussing uh, what we mean by listening and then what is the idea or what is the notion of courageous listening. Um, so I have a quote here and I'll start us off with that today. So courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, you cannot practice any other virtue consistently. So we, we have borrowed that uh, for Dr. Maya Angelou. Uh, and then we post the question, what might it take or why might it take courage to, to listen and to engage in these transformative conversations? So for the sake of everyone here in the audience and for our team, um, we incorporated a, a video which was engaging in transformative conversations um, and talking across the color line by Dr. Amanda Kemp. So that video is available to you on the website. But what we wanted to do is share the biggest takeaways from that video as it relates to the conversation that we're gonna to have today. Um, so I will share an overview and then the team will share how they connected uh, with Dr. Kemp's guidance. So there were four, essentially four primary principles that related to having these transformative conversations. So what is the how to, how do we do that? Um, and I think Dr. Kemp does an excellent job of just giving us some structure. So her first uh, point of guidance was talking about being able to check in with yourself. So having a clear understanding of what you need, you know, from an emotional perspective before we in, begin to engage in what can be considered sometimes a very difficult conversation. And you're doing that all, really, this entire piece by allowing this sense of unconditional love and acceptance to flow through you at all times when you're having this conversation. And so the next space is by doing that is that we're able to create and hold the space for differing perspectives. So this is really about leaning in 
to someone who may have a different experience and more so a different perspective than our own. And the way that we do that, there are two steps that Dr. Kemp discusses. So the first was really about asking questions and really beginning to learn more about whatever this different experience or different point of view may be. And then we allow ourselves, we give everybody the opportunity to hear the story. And so once we've learned a little bit more about their perspective, then we lean in and we ask, would you like to hear what it's like for me? In any given conversation, and particularly when we're most polarized, so those were the four primary steps, but I want to open it up to the group um, so that you all can share how you connected with uh, Dr. Kemp's philosophy and this concept of creating space for these transformative conversations. And anyone is next. I'll, I'll um, jump in just because it, um, first of all, to all the panelists out there, when you do have an opportunity, if you've not already, please uh, do watch the video. Um, it's very powerful, but one of the things that um, immediately, well, the whole thing, <laughs> the whole thing appealed to me. I mean, there's so much about it, but the one thing that um, I took away and I wrote it down was that we have to connect with people that do not agree with us. And I think anybody that's paying attention now, especially, uh, that is so true. I honestly think that that our um, our sole survival depends on it sometimes. Like we really have to learn how to have those difficult conversations um, and to be brave, uh, but also um, to, to make sure that you are in the right space to do that. Um, and that's one of the things I'm sure someone will bring out as well. But that was one of the things she said, just uh, we have to connect with people that do not agree with us, that we don't have to like them. We don't have to, they don't have to be our BFFs. You know, we just have to be able to connect with them and understand that they are, that we are all humans <laughs> um, here, you know, and that's, you know, whether we like it or not, we really need to be working on making that work for us and not against each other. Um, so that was, that was one of my big takeaways, but I know there was, there's a lot to unpack. So I know some of you have a lot to say as well. I really enjoyed um, the videos um, in Dr. Kemp's message. Um, it goes back to, there's another person has a great, um, a great quote that, you know, most people don't listen with the intent to understand. They listen to reply. And one of the things that I took away from the video um, with uh, Dr. Kemp was that um, it's not about being right. I think everyone wants to be heard and wants to be right. And, and it, it's, it, you know, it's okay that we don't agree. We don't have the same, um, you know, we're not gonna come to the consensus, consensus that we're gonna agree, but it's just to being able to hear someone else's point of view and that you're actively listening and, and just being open to listening to what that is um, really made an impact um, with me from the video. Um, well, for, for, for me, I think like initially from, from Go watching it, she, she instantly grabbed me because one of the things that stood out was that this was recorded in 2017. And while we were already headed toward this, this, this extreme polarization, um, one of the things that she had said that like really struck a chord is she said, when we, when we fall into us versus them thinking, when we demonize whole groups of people, when we're lying, when we're laying the groundwork for, um, for, for um, spirals of violence, then we're laying the groundwork for spirals of violence, slavery, and even genocide. And I'm thinking, did she just like predict, you know, <laughs> the future for us? And as we see, you know, and, 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 I, and, I, and it really spoke to me because I, I thought about the idea of listening um, and knowing how polarizing that we, we, you know, the country's in at this moment, the polarizing state that we're in. Um, I find myself trying to understand 
both sides, you know? Um, this is why in my household, we, we, we flip from CNN and MB, MSNBC to, to Fox News, because I, I want to know, like, did I miss something? You know what I mean? Because I'm getting one side, but then I, I need to know the other, you know? And when I start hearing the other side, initially it was triggering, um, but everyone's different. That people see things differently. We can all, you know, this is why witnesses have different stories of the same exact event. You know what I mean? And so, you know, it, it's one of those things where you, you know, thinking about last night, the one thing that I thought was a positive across the board was the, the conversation of um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Scalia being friends. You know what I mean, and 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 I'm pretty sure they had so much uh, that they differed with in, in so many ways, but they realized that the most important things were the things that they had in common. You know that they could still go to the opera together, you know, and enjoy that without having to fall victim to this polarizing, you know, nature of things. Um, so that that really stood out to me. So when, when I first listened to it a couple, uh, well, it was probably six weeks ago or so, and I reviewed it again the last couple of times, last couple uh, days or so, I looked at it as she's challenging us. She's putting a challenge out there for us. Uh, and she's saying, we can do better. And it starts with you taking that first step. Um, and so, and that, and that step is a courageous step to take. Uh, and and um, not everyone can do it. Not everyone's ready to do it. Um, everyone will figure out that that um, that time on their own. Yes, um, my my view on it. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, Dr. Amanda Kemp's uh, message is extremely timely. It's just what we need at this point in in in, in time in our history, uh, based on what we're going through as a nation. Um, my my big takeaway, uh, the way I see it in her message was. Uh, I saw like a, a winning formula uh, in a way that uh, uh, when I first uh, saw the video and heard the message, I, I, I thought, well, you know, uh, it, it's good that she has this message and um, why would someone do it? And how can you convince someone to do this or to see things differently? And the first thing that she says is that the person uh, must, and I wrote this down too, <laughs> They have to ask. They have to ask themselves: Is this the right moment for 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 me to to take on this message? Is this the right moment for me to speak about to have this dialogue? So the person first must have must ask themselves: Is this the right time? And if it is, then they must commit to having the goal of unconditional love, or what whatever else you want you may want to call it. Uh, Maybe uh, the goal is the agreement and understanding. And, and lastly, um, I, I think that um, if someone gets to a point where they cannot go beyond that um, because they have issues with, with that particular group or that particular ideology, then it's always good to find a common ground or, or find someone within that group that, that you really look up to that will help you then transition to a better understanding so I think uh, her message is very complex and yet it's simple. And if you follow the, her, her, her guidelines, it's very helpful. And, and I think healing to, to this nation at this very moment in time. Uh, man, I, I, I totally agree with you all. Um, you know, I've been um, studying Dr. Kemp and, and thinking about this time, kind of where we are in this moment. And everything that you all said, you know, I connected with as well. I think what was most um, impactful for me was the recognition that I can accept a different perspective and not agree with it. And I think that at one time I thought it was either or, right? Um, but it really isn't, it's a both. It's not this or that, it really is both. And so we are sophisticated enough. And I think she, she reminded me that we truly are sophisticated enough to do both. Um, and for me, it gave me what I feel like I desperately needed were the tools to have the conversation. 
because I think that a lot of times people can't have these conversations. It's not because they don't want to. It's not because it's not something that's on their minds. And it's not because it's, uh, the conversation is not important. It's just, I don't know how. And the, the focus of the kind of where are you on the spectrum of having the conversation? You know, are you exhausted by it? You know, because you feel like you've had it too much? Or are you afraid that I'm going to have it, but if I get in there, I'm going to say the wrong thing? And I think she gave us the permission to make mistakes, but to be grounded in our own perspective and be grounded in love. And so those are the principles that can help us talk across what we feel like is just this chasm of um, just conversation that we just can't have. And I think that through that perspective was the first time that I was able to see the how to you know, how to, to move across and have those meaningful conversations. Um, so it was all impactful. I, I, I co-sign on everything everyone just said. Um, and so I, I share those connections with you. Um, so now that we've, we've all had our opportunity, yes, has anyone not spoken? Let me, let me take a go at it as well. Yes. <laughs> uh, Nigel, before I start, I just want to give a shout out to Allison as a returning uh, listener. Allison, Yay! Back here. <laughs> welcome back, Allison. <laughs> welcome back, Allison. I appreciate that. Uh, the way I look at it is, you know, it brings to my mind uh, what I read uh, Dr. Maya Angelo say once that um, it's not, you know, it's while it's important, uh, you know, on the words uh, that you might utter but it's also the way in which you say it. In other words, uh, if you don't say it in the right frame or in the right you know, body language or cues, then that could get a little offensive. And also the other thing that came to my mind is a couple of, uh, you know, I read a lot of poetry and, it, and there's a poetry in a foreign language that I once read, which says that if you decide to dip yourself in the holy Ganges, you might just get holy, which means <laughs> That, that if you dip yourself in somebody else's perspective, you might begin to share and empathize with that perspective. But if you choose to be detached, you will never get it. Mm. So in order for you to get it, or at least get an understanding, may not, you may not agree, you got to dip into that perspective. Uh, and then you realize very quickly that there are different ways uh, to the truth. There are different ways. Ultimately, what uh, we, we looked at Ginsburg as well as Scalia, the main thing was the love for country. They mm -hmm. had love for the country. They had love for the constitution. They came and they came from different angles, but the common ground was love for country, love for constitution. So, so also in a community, we got to understand that our love is probably no more greater or lesser than somebody else who has a different opinion. It's probably the same, if not more. So we have no right to believe that that we love our community, our family, or, or our country, just because we do it in a particular way or express it in a particular way. And that's what I see from the video. We got to empathize. We got to see there are different ways to reach that goal to demonstrate love for country or love for community. So that's what I, that's the, that's what I got from this whole thing. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I share those connections as well. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to do a little heavy lifting. Um, and go into kind of the focus question of the dialogue today. So each of us will take two minutes uh, to answer one and only one of the questions below. Uh, we will do so without crosstalk or interruption. And then after everyone has had an opportunity to respond, we will allow for clarifying and follow-up questions and responses. Uh, we will also continue to explore additional questions as time allows. Uh, so anyone is up next. I try to start us off tonight. Uh, and I started thinking about this last night as I was uh, watching the debate uh, as well. I think most of us probably were. Uh, and the, the question is, you know, what fears, um, if any, do you have about uh, how you feel or what you'll say when listening to when people have different beliefs than you? And I think part of that, and, and maybe I'm completely wrong with this, but I think part, part of that is, um, what if I'm wrong? You know, what if I have the wrong viewpoint and I'm completely off kilter? Uh, and, um, you know, we, we, 
we want to be right. We want to say, hey, I, I, this is right. I believe this. This is what it should be. But if you're wrong, that takes a, it, 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 there's a fear with that. And, and it makes you maybe step back a second and say, what have I been doing? What have I been living? What have I been saying? Um, and so that, that, I think, is a big fear for a lot of people um, as well. You know, um, you know, we can be opponents, uh, but we don't have to be enemies. Um, you know, and, and again, we're dealing with, you know, Ginsburg and Scalia, we can, they can talk about their opponents on the court, they have different viewpoints, but they were never enemies. Uh, and, you know, the last question last night that they had uh, from an, I think it was an eighth grade girl, the simple answer was, we just believe something different of the way we want to move the country. We're not enemies, but neither one of the candidates said that last night. Uh, and I think they missed an opportunity uh, to say, hey, you know, we just believe something totally different, but but we're working towards the same goal. We want to have a better place, a better country. We just have different viewpoints uh, of how we're going to get there. Um, but I don't think either one of them are willing to say, uh, uh, willing to say that, and and to be that vulnerable on a national, you know, TV screen as well too. Um, I'd like to take the question of how do you feel when there is silence or gaps in conversation, because I'm not a silent person, but I realize very, very often, when there's a gap, when there's a silence, there's a bridge being constructed. There's a bridge between the two differing opinions. Now, it could also be that people are detached, but the good possibility is that there's a thought process that is going in somebody's mind and saying, wait a minute, I didn't think about that. Let me stay quiet. Let me listen and not just hear and a bridge is being is happening. There's a the, the gap is basically a way for people to connect with the other person, and 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 I think a gap or a silence is very important because sometimes it means uh, a, you know to be silent. It probably has a, a silence. They say is deafening. It could actually give clearly a signal to the other person that okay, I'm making some inroads into the other person's thought perspective. So to me a silence or a gap in a conversation actually is very productive if utilized properly and not with a viewpoint that he's silent or she's silent because I won this conversation, I won this argument, but more because the person, we've got to be gracious enough to say the person is thinking and perhaps we'll come back where we can meet a common ground. Okay, I guess I'll go. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I will. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm going to answer the um, what are the potential benefits you might receive from listening to others with differing beliefs. Um, for me, I, I, you know, going back to that, watching the the Fox News, um, you know, to to see what the other side thinks. Um, for me, it, it gives you the opportunity. I think the, the main benefit is it gives you the opportunity to, to, to get to the reasons why they believe what they believe. You know, it's asking the questions to dig a little deeper. You know, it's not, you know, because people come in with preconceived notions of why someone does or believes or, you know, or is the way they are and without knowing what may have occurred to make them feel that way. You know, in the same way that, you know, one person may love, you know, this candidate they, and hate the next, the other person loves that other person, you know, and, and it's, it, it's like, well, why do you, what is it? You know, I don't think we ever really get to that point where we ask those questions. Um, and, and, and I thought about it while I was watching the video from Dr. Kemp and I was thinking about, thinking about like the idea of curiosity. And as a child, curiosity is encouraged you know, ask questions, find out why. But then as we start to go, you know, get older and go through school, we're, we're, we're constantly taught about what we can't do. And most of it deals with asking questions that matter. So instantly in the workplace, you're told, don't talk about religion, don't talk about race, and, and you know, and don't talk about politics. <laughs> you know, we, we're, we're told instantly and we're taught not to do those things. But in, in not realizing that it, what it does is it creates that divide and then we shut off because we don't want to listen to a differing point of view because we've, taught, we've been taught that 
you don't do it. You know, you don't want to know why. You want to just write them off and, they, you know, don't do it, you know, if, you, if you've actually approached the idea, you know, because, again, we're taught not to do these things. So, you know, that, you know, to me, the potential benefit of it all was probably just thinking about the idea of being able to find out more about one another. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Yeah, I would, um, you know, I was actually going to talk about something else, but I want to piggyback off of what Victor said, because really, um, you, you struck a chord with the curiosity, because it, it's something that I, I think it does kind of get, it's so important for our survival, right? When we're human beings, like we're taught, like we, we're curious about heat, so we go to touch it and we learn that it can burn. And it's like, and we have to be curious creatures to keep evolving and I and I hate that sometimes it shuts down and doesn't lend itself to reaching to other people and um, so yes the potential benefits you might receive from listening to others is absolutely it's not just uh, filling the curiosity but it, it's it's part of of evolving and being better people and, and understanding because the thing I was going to answer <laughs> was uh, what fears do you have about um, if you're talking to someone who's, whose beliefs differ from yours is, I get angry. I mean, I'm being very honest. I, I have fought with <laughs> anger. Um, you know, it's, I'm what you would call a slow burner, you know, like it takes a while, but then once it goes, it goes. And, and I think that if you combine those two questions, like for me, um, the potential benefits are that the more that I learn about someone, and the more I understand, then the easier it's going to be to overcome my fears of losing my temper or, or my fears of insulting someone or something like that. And to me, that's, it's just, again, I'll say Dr. Kemp's um, video is, it really did strike a chord with me because I think we could all benefit from it. But th that's how I would, I answered too. So there you go. <laughs> I'll turn it over to somebody else. I'm going to piggyback. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> No, go ahead. I was going to say that's okay. It's quite all right. But, go ahead, Kimberly. <laughs> no, but, I, but I'm going to actually answer the first one with, you know, what does courageous listening mean? And it kind of goes with what Julia said. Um, yes, you know, being afraid that you're going to react in a certain manner takes that courageous listening is like, to me, it means um, basically when you're listening, you're, um, you're kind of putting judgment aside. And I think with, when I listen to people, I'm actively listening, but I'm kind of saying to myself, did they just say that? Okay. That's not necessarily coming directed toward toward me. It's something that they've ex either experienced, it's something that has affected them, They're, it's coming from their heart. Because when I'm listening, I li I'm listening to their priorities and what's important to them, how, you know, how are they, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm questioning, I've got a lot of questions in my head. And so what, you're, what you've said, Julia, is like, you've got to ask questions. And so by, while I'm listening, I'm, I'm, I'm questioning. I'm like, this isn't necessarily directed toward me. I'm not going to pass judgment. This is, something, this is something that they've either learned. It's something, their, their behavior, you know, some, something going on with them. So that's how, what, that's how I tend to um, adjust my anger. I kind of like, okay, I'm not gonna take this on, I'm just gonna listen and I'm gonna actively listen. Um, I think it's important for, to allow someone to share their experience without putting myself in their experience. So that's how courageous listening, that's how I, what I, how I define courageous listening. Um, I've had uh, an opportunity to actually, you know, listen to someone that's not my race, talk about another person of a different race. And I was just sitting there 
didn't say anything. And it was just a, 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 about, about a name, you know, is that really their name? Maybe they switched it and it, it could be this and that. And I was just sitting there and listening. And then it got quiet because it was a group of us. And, and I said, well, what if that is really their name? And they were here before you and that is their name. So why are you saying that? You know, I, that, that's the, you know, the question that I had for them. What, what, what's causing you to think that way? I just wanna know. So it's just stepping, kind of stepping back and asking questions. And I think that's uh, what courageous listening means. Um, I also wanted to, to answer the, uh, the question, what does courageous listening mean to me? Um, and uh, first of all, I, I want to say that I agree with Julia and, and Kimberly as well. Um, and, and the way I see it also is that um, courageous listening is willing to, to hear those things that I shelter myself from listening. It's having the courage to, to be open, to, to hear the things that might get me upset or, or, or things that I'm, uh, I'd rather not hear. <laughs> just having the courage to listen and, and 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 try to understand why that that point of view you know is being presented or um or, or just being open to a conversation and not being afraid to talk about the tough things and things that are maybe hurtful or things that may be controversial to you or to that person um so that uh uh Dr. Kim really brought brought that out in, in her in her presentation, and I um, I've learned a lot from that. Thank you. Who's next? Well, I know I answered a, the question earlier, but uh, as I was thinking about the questions and and and. Um, going over these again. I remember the story when I was younger. I was uh, an acolyte at church and I uh, was helping with the service sitting in the front row and as the sermon was going on I closed my eyes and after the service the minister said I saw you were sleeping in the front row that takes courage. <laughs> and I, said, I wasn't sleeping I was just focusing on the sermon and the lesson and so it just came back to you know that Maybe that was my first bout of courageous listening uh, when I was, you know, 11 or 12 years old, and I didn't realize it uh, at the time. And so um, it was a great memory thinking about that because that was uh, a conversation that I didn't want to have, of course, because I wasn't sleeping. And, and I don't know how I could have related, uh, you know, to say, hey, I wasn't sleeping, but I was not sleeping. So uh, so maybe that was my first <laughs> bout of courageous listening when, when I was 11 or 12 years or whatever that, that age frame was. So. You have to start somewhere. <laughs> well, um, you might as well start in church, <laughs> right, I guess. <laughs> you have to start somewhere. Um, I think I'll answer. These are really tough questions, right? Um, what are the potential benefits you might receive from listening to others with different perspectives? This one was this question really, I had to sit with it. Um, because one of the things that I realized, and I don't know if it's just as you grow, you know, um, and there's a, a pressing need as an adult to be right. The, the, this issue of, of being right. And one of the things that I didn't remember until I was answering this question was the uh, point that Dr. Kemp made about, well, what is it that you're listening for? when you're engaging in these conversations with people with different perspectives. And what really resonated with me is that I'm not, um, this issue about being right is, is rooted in facts, right? It's about kind of saying, well, let me listen and let me listen for what needs to be corrected versus when I'm really talking about having a true connection with another person, I'm listening for the feelings. And that was something that she brought out that in this, this need to, to be right, that I wasn't listening for, well, how did this experience make that person feel? And, and can I connect and learn a little bit more about that? Because that's what really, 
either. You know, the sense to be feeling to be connected to something. It's a two-hour evaluation of history. Those kinds of conversations are seldom rooted in the past. They're really rooted in the sense of what happened. You know, what happened? How did I feel about that? It's kind of what story is going to try and share. Uh, so for me, the, the potential benefit of uh, extending that ability to listen is a truly deep connection. And you know, meaningful connections with someone else. Where I'm not trying to teach, you know, that's not the meaning of the connection. You know, I'm really trying to get in and understand what someone else's experience was. And if I can do that, you know, then to me, then we can find a common ground because I can connect to that sense of feeling. So I don't have to necessarily agree with how the person has to talk about certain facts, but I have to talk. Um, but I can be that I can accumulate my understanding. So that to me is probably the biggest benefit of being able to listen to someone with a different point of view. Do we have anyone else on our team? Has everyone spoken? Donald, did you speak? Did everyone speak? Uh -huh. I, I already spoke and I'm, I'm, I'm trying the silence thing. The silence, the Kimberly, you know, I'm trying to become the listener like Kimberly. <laughs> That's kind of hard. <laughs> um, How do you well, do it, Kimberly? <laughs> <laughs> this is a good time for follow-up. We're at this point in the, the dialogue now that we've all spoken. Uh, we can go back in and follow up. So Donald has started us off with the question to Kimberly, Kimberly uh, excuse me, about uh, how do we listen? <laughs> Well, I guess, I, I think it, when you have an older sister talk for you for the first five <laughs> years of your life, uh, that's how you, you know, you're in your developing stages. That's how it gets started. You just listen. <laughs> she did all the talking. But um, I don't know. Um, I think when I got into high school, I didn't, I wanted to be heard. I wanted to participate. I wanted to be in student government, which means I have to speak up. Um, I, I wanted to be a cheerleader, but at the same time, I, also mass communications major. I didn't necessarily speak, but I wanted, it was something that I desired to do, but I listened. I don't know, I don't know, I just, I'm just a, a listener. I think I got it from my dad, because he's very quiet. I don't know, it's just something that I prefer to, in order to understand, there's a seek first to understand, then be understood. So before I can make an assumption or about something, because I think that that's what's, there's, there's a lot of blind spots and, and, and Amanda Kemp talked about this. We have a lot of blind spots and there's a lot of assumptions that are made. And going back to what Niger said about being right, you know, it's like, well, how can, what is it that I need to understand before I, so that I don't make assumptions? So let me sit back and think about this before I speak, because I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, I think that's kind of maybe up here. And, you know, that's kind of how I, I roll, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I was, Kimberly, I was thinking about, you know, the idea of listening and I, and I was thinking about it, you know, internalizing why I choose to listen. And if I'm being 100% honest with myself, it's, it's, it's all about trust. You know, I don't know you or whomever, and thus I don't trust you until you show me enough about yourself that shows me that you're trustworthy. You know, and, 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 I, and I thought about it like, well, is that, is that necessarily a, a, a good or bad trait? I don't know. Um, I just know that I come from a, a school of idea that, you know, trust is earned, you know, and, and that's key. And, and it's, it's, the, it's the key to a lot of things. It was always trust and respect. You know, if I have both of those things, I'm good, you know, and, and you're good in, with me as far as in standing. You know, as long as I can trust you and I and I respect you, 
you know, and you trust and respect me, then we're fine. And so I was thinking like, as I was listening to everyone speak, as well as listen, watching the video from Dr. Kemp, it, it really, it really came down to accepting that part of myself that, you know, the reasons why I choose to listen is not because I'm genuinely interested in something that someone's saying or in the individual. It's more of just really trying to weed them, you know, weed it all out, you know, like eventually they're going to say something that's either going to make me feel I can trust them or I can't, you know, and it's kind of like, I, I realize I'm waiting for that moment. Like whether it's a, whether it's a positive or a negative, you know, I'm, I'm kind of waiting, you know, and, and, and I, and I, and I realized that I, I think I was taught that not knowingly, you know, taught that. And I, and I find myself sometimes telling my children that same kind of thing, like give them time, you know, what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, cause kids are always quick. That's my friend. You don't know that person, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm always kind of like, give them time, you know, to show you who they really are, you know, and then you can make a decision on whether or not you want to call them your friend. Um, <laughs> That, that was one of the things that I, I, I was thinking about why I listen, you know, so much, but it's always just waiting for a moment, you know, sometimes it comes, sometimes it doesn't, you know, but it's just put on pause for a later date, you know, <laughs> if the opportunity arises. Um, I have to, uh, let me jump in. I have to follow up because I didn't write this down and I will forget if I don't, but <laughs> Victor, that is such that is such a true moment. Like this is totally authentic, right? Uh, because when I think about, you know, well, do you listen or or kind of what is the purpose? <laughs> and I until you said that, I didn't realize how much I entered into most conversations thinking about myself. You know, like that 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 is this whole part of this conversation is the first time that I realized that engaging in most in critical conversations. They were really focused on me, you know, like, what am I thinking? How am I going to feel about this? Kind of what am I going to respond to? And then, of course, there's the notion of being right. You know, where am I going to go in and make the corrections and make this thing right? And so I think that this is the first time that I've realized that most of the conversations that I approached were about me. It was never really about the other person that I was talking to. And it really wasn't about so much getting to understand them, their point of view, or for me to learn. I was never approaching it like that. It was always like, well, let me, you know, show this person what they need to know. You know, like that, that was the, the whole thing. And, and, and so now I, I just totally relate to that um, because it does take a moment to be authentically um, engaged in another person. And I don't think that I realized that until we had this dialogue and, and being kind of really focused on kind of another person, you know, like not me, but like truly focusing in on another person. So like this, this has been, <laughs> this has been huge for me, but I, I, I just had to say, I relate to like literally everything you just said. <laughs> You know, when you, when you just said, and I felt, and this was a moment where I said, well, maybe this, this one part of me that I felt like, oh, that was really a bad trait, is when you said that you were, you were going to show them wh where they were wrong, kind of like how you were right. And I was thinking, wow, I, I don't, I don't, like, I realize in myself that when I'm having those kind of conversations, I don't really concern myself whether or not, like, I don't want to take on that task of, showing someone how they're wrong and how I'm right. <laughs> like, like that doesn't, that doesn't ever play a part in that discussion for me. For me, it's, that's like, I mean, that's not even registering on the radar. It's, it's more of, because I'm only in listening mode at that point, I, I'm still just waiting for the, for the opportunity to, to arise for this person to either show me something good or show me something bad. You know, but when they show me something bad, I, I don't, I don't have that need to, to show them how they're wrong. I, I just instantly, you know, check it off and, <laughs> and, and know yeah. how I move, how I move forward in the future. Uh, That's a good thing because it's exhausting. 
Like I just realized how exhausting it is to actually get into that, that posture. It's, mm -hmm. it's exhausting. Well, let's think about how social media has changed that though. It gives people an opportunity to share their point of view without listening to mm. a point of view. And so, you know, we, we've seen it now for, you know, four, five, six years, wherever that time frame is. I don't know what that time frame is, but I think those barriers are, are being pressed uh, mm -hmm. a little more because people uh, maybe are not held accountable uh, or they're willing to just throw that information out there, whether it's correct, incorrect, conspiracy mm -hmm. theory, conspiracy narrative, whatever we want to mm -hmm. call it but they're not willing to, to listen. So they can courageously share, but they're not going to courageously open themselves up to, to a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things is that I've been studying quite a bit uh, is, is the concept of active listening. You know, the, you know, typically the three types of listening, you do active listening, you do reflective listening, you do empathetic listening, but uh, you know, what, what, what do we do when we listen? We basically listen to obtain information. We, we actually listen to understand. We listen to enjoy. We listen to learn. But no matter what you do, if you don't practice effective listening, you only are retaining 25% of whatever you listen because you're not focusing. You're not concentrating. You're not there. And many times, especially for somebody like myself, where my brain sometimes is sticking faster than my mouth, you know, I'm absorbing everything you see. So sometimes that can be a problem because people think I'm not listening, but actually I am because my brain is working so fast before you utter it. I've already, but the danger with that is I'm probably making certain assumptions that you're going to make and I could be wrong because I'm assuming that you're going to say these things and you could be saying something totally different because I'm going to be listening from my experience. So for me, what's important now is active listening. Am I, am I focusing? Am I concentrating? Am I retaining? And then and then only learning happens. Because even if I do active listening as a practitioner, I still will only retain probably less than 50%. Mm -hmm. And if you don't use active listening as a concept, it's probably less than 10%. Because we just hear and we move on. Because hey, it's not going to affect us. We just hear something and move on. Mm -hmm. It's important uh, to practice that. And, and, and sometimes uh, I do that uh, when I go to my chapel. You know, and I, and I sit before the blessed sacrament, I sit in adoration, I say, you know, Lord, I want to listen for that million dollars. Stuff. I'm just going to listen now. And when I started doing that, I realized my interaction with people were getting better because now I have learned to keep quiet, but listen to them. And then you have those, those big pregnant pauses because the person is saying, I'm saying all these things, but he's not said anything. And I say, continue. And the person now begins to feel that I empathize with them and they're willing to share much more. They're willing to open up. And so that's why I would say, I would tell the, uh, the people who are listening on to this group uh, or even our panel members is practice a little bit of, you know, of a little of both active listening, reflective and empathetic, depending on the situation, because it'll help. It definitely will help the quality of our ability to think, our ability to react to a situation. Yeah, yeah that, that really, I have a lot of connections with that. Um, we're nearing the end of our, our 40 minute time frame. So we have about, uh, about just a few more minutes, just a few more minutes. Did anyone else want to add in? Yes, uh, I, I, I wanted to just add with, uh, real quick, quickly, um, mm -hmm. that I, um, I the, 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 the concept of uh, un unconditional love and mm -hmm. unconditional acceptance mm -hmm. that is uh, mentioned by Dr. Kemp. Uh, reminds me a lot of um, a book I read uh, in college uh, to the philosophy class. Um, and I read a book about, it was called I and Thou by uh, Martin Buber. And it, it, it talks about um, having the, giving the full attention to the person that is in front of you mm -hmm. and, 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 and just listening to them and being there in the moment with them. Mm. And it's almost a mystical experience once you do that, mm -hmm. because yes, in the end, it will lead to the unconditional love and unconditional acceptance if you just are willing to to listen to that person in front of you and and and, and, and focus on on what they're saying. It's, it's a for me, respect is a big thing. So it's 
is a way of respecting that that human being that is in front of you, and being able to to, to listen to what they say and, and not be judgmental. That uh, I, I just I remember that from my college years. Yeah, I'm so glad. I'll definitely make sure we leave that as a resource um, because I do think that um, just kind of pulling together a lot of the things that you said, um, particularly Todd, reminds me of how instantaneous communication is right now with social media. Uh, and it's very one-sided. You know, people put things out there. And it's not about uh, having the communication and focusing on another person as it is about just kind of getting that, that point of view or that thought out there. And so the notion of, um, in light of everything that's going on, whether it's the civil unrest, whether it's COVID, and everything that people are grappling with, just taking a moment or time to focus on someone uh, and to be with them, be present with them, um, it is something that we really have to create the time and the space for. Um, so yes, Dr. Kemp, um, I think she reminds us of that, you know, the need to create that time to space and environment where we can really have genuine uh, human connection uh, at a time where that seems very difficult to do. Um, we have two more minutes. So was there was there anyone else that wanted to share that on before we move on? Yeah, yeah. I, just, oh, oh, I just wanted to say something about what you had said, um, Todd. About you know when you when you mentioned about you know the social media, I just thought about like is this are we are we speaking from a specific generation talking about communication? You know mm -hmm. because if you're if you're born in the '90s, you communicate in a completely different way. We've mm -hmm. all adapted but we still hold on to those other things. You know, 20 years ago, if I wanted to say something to you, I'd call you on the phone. Yeah. Now I'd send you an email. And, and, and it really plays a, a greater part in the workplace. You know, mm -hmm. you used to have conversations with your, your manager or your supervisor. Now mm -hmm. they wanna send you the email so <laughs> that there's this kind of record, you know, yeah. of the conversation. You know, or you get this kind of like email and then of course that's always open for interpretation, mm -hmm. you know, whereas in the past you you'd got the phone call and there would never be the confusion, you know, as to what they meant by that mm -hmm. particular thing. Um, so I, I was I was questioning when when he when he when he said the thing about the social media, I was thinking, is is this more of a generational issue, you know, and are you know, and is this going to be a greater problem? for the younger generations coming up because they don't have those tools that Dr. Kemp is trying to give. They don't have the tools to even begin to make that happen because mm. they've never really practiced or even seen proper communication between Ooh. others. That's almost a different dialogue, man. They can uh, no, add it, on it just came dialogue, to my mind. Like. <laughs> Yeah, we're gonna have to add that one on, on, I think, because yes, that's a I whole, whole no like, <laughs> we, we, we'll be here all night if we open up that, because <laughs> I've got a lot to say. <laughs> I know, it's like, we only have like one minute before we have to go to the reflections, but that is like so deep, uh, because Todd kind of opened it up, but, you know, Victor brought it home, because, uh, and even with listening to Nicholas, that, that how do we connect? and have meaningful connection and, and, and how do we create this space, you know, like Dr. Kemp is talking about. Really going in and being intentional and leaning into the different perspective. Not a sound bite, you know, not kind of a pundit saying this or that, but really going in and trying to understand. Um, we may, we may have to add, that might just be another dialogue we put on at the end of this series to tackle that. I think it's important I think the workplace implications uh, particularly are important, uh, particularly now because we're working remotely, right? So those are the forms of communication that we have in place. So it, it kind of creates opportunity for misunderstanding even with that. So uh, did anyone want to have like five seconds to, to say something to, to uh, Victor's piece before we move on to reflection? <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say one thing real quick and it's kind of about what Victor just said, but we keep talking about tools. And I think what Dr. Kemp, it, like if you go below the surface, what we're saying is we have, we have ears and a mouth. 
And I think we have to learn how to use them both with our brain and our heart mm. <laughs> as well. And that's, it's like beyond, yeah, we're just there. That's like ears, that. mouth, heart, <laughs> brain. There we, we need go. to learn how to be compassionate. And that's what it is, compassion. It's like, right. say, it's like they say, you have a mouth in two years, use it in the same proportion. Mm. You know, or uh, to talk to Victor, I just want to say something. Um, and uh, is Socrates said right from the time of uh, his days uh, that Aristotle had no idea what he was doing. So every generation <laughs> will always come down and say, wait a minute, these guys have no clue what they're talking about. <laughs> and, and, and I'm sure, uh, you know, our, our parents said the same thing about us and we say mm -hmm. the same thing about the next generation. And that's why they call it the generational gap. But uh, effective people will find methods to communicate and listen. Absolutely. Very well said. I hate to, to move on, but we're at the hour. Um, so moving us in now to reflection. Um, and we'll spend about 10, 15 minutes here so that we'll make sure that we have time for reflection from the group. Um, so we're in the final round. This is round three. three. Uh, so we'll take a minute or two each to answer one of the following questions. And anyone that wants to start off can, can start us off. I think the most valuable uh, thing that I learned in this conversation is uh, to figure out the art of listening. How do, we, uh, how do we empathize? How do we understand? I heard Victor say that you, he flips between CNN and Fox. I heard, uh, you know, Kimberly said that she will give a listener because she probably inherited for her dad or her sister who was spoken of. So the key thing of all of this is in order for you to be effective, in order for you to be able to be reflected and, and empathize is uh, it's okay to have those pauses, those pregnant pauses, because now you're listening, you're learning to actively understand another person's perspective by dipping your shoes or dipping yourself into that person's milieu. You may not accept it, but you're actually dipping yourself to get a full body experience, so to speak. And you come out of it as a much richer person. So that's the, that's the thing that I found valuable in this conversation because all of us come from different background, different ethnicity, but we've had different life experience. But at the end of the day, we're all saying the same thing. Thank you. Next. I would, um, um, I think for me, the next step, just for me personally, would to be to, to really try to apply what Dr. Kemp said about giving myself space, having that unconditional love, which Nicholas underscores, uh, and because it is uh, so important, it's just so to actually keep trying to lean into those conversations and practice it at home um, as well sometimes and uh, with family and friends, but uh, throughout. But I really do think that um, le leaning into those conversations is really important. So I think for me, the next step would for, for me to just apply that um, in life. Well said. Next. Um, I think um, for, for myself, I think that one of the things that um, I found to be really valuable was the idea of, you know, taking that breath, that space, you know, and thinking about it, not just simply as a physical thing of breathing, but, you know, just how it would, how it feels to breathe you know, just on a, a metaphorically, you know, in, in, in all aspects of life, you know, and taking those moments to take a step back, you know, you know, Donald said the pregnant pause, you know, if you're an actor, it's, you know, you take the beat on a line, you know what I mean? And taking that beat gives you that opportunity to, to, to make it more impactful. Um, and so thinking about, you know, taking that time to, to breathe and, and really listen, um, to me was, was, was the key thing that I, I think I really took from her. I mean, I think I was doing it in, in certain aspects of my life, um, but I, I, you know, thinking about it specifically when it comes to diversity and, and, and the discussions that we're having, I, I realized that there, there's, there's room for, for growth and in, 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 in adding it to these sort of conversations. Nice. Next. What was meaningful for me um, was the how she 
we talked about fear and um, how fear impacts our ability to listen. Um, and with that fear, how we respond and react um, to listening by either, um, you know, putting on armor, or, you know, having to be right, you know, that sort of thing. That, that was a really meaningful um, part of this conversation. And I think Todd also, you know, be, brought up being uh, fearful of saying the wrong thing um, and how to um, reflect on that. And if you're, you know, feel fearful of saying the wrong thing, it's you know, how we can possibly ask a question about that. So that was pretty meaningful and valuable for me. Um, <clears throat> what I want to say, what was meaningful and valuable to me is, it's just having the courage to, to, to just face those conversations. I think um, a lot of people, you know, that are out there, um, you know, being violent and, and doing all kinds of things um, are just afraid. They're, they're, they don't have the courage to just, well, have the space, make the space for transformation as Dr. Kim will we'll, we'll, we'll say. They just don't, don't have the courage to, to listen to the other. To, they're afraid that they hear what the other has to say, and, and it takes a lot of courage to do that. So uh, to me, that has been the most valuable part of this conversation. Um, and I think uh, I, it's a challenge. I, I challenge anyone out there to, to, be, to have the courage to do that, to be able to, to, to make the space and talk to people and, and listen to people without, be, be, without being judgmental, just listening first. Ah, uh, yes. Um, I'll take the, the, the first question to kind of what was most meaningful and valuable in this conversation to me. Um, I've just grown so much, I think, from learning from you all and hearing um, your experience and your perspective. And I think that I leave this conversation um, empowered um, by you all and by Dr. Kemp's teaching because uh, based on those things, I know two things. Uh, one, there's not a conversation out there that I can't have. Um, and I didn't know that before. I think that there were many conversations, many topics that I felt were untouchable and that I, I couldn't do those things. I couldn't say those things. Um, but now I know that's not true. Um, there's no conversation out there that's bigger than me um, and my desire to, to make those human connections. And I now know that I, I have the skill um, and the sense of compassion where I can do those things. And so that to me um, is incredibly empowering at a time that I feel like many people may feel powerless. Uh, and they feel like there is not very much that they can do or say in this moment uh, that could be impactful. Um, but we have more power than we think. Uh, and so that, that's what's been most meaningful uh, in this conversation for me. I'm going to go back to one of the first things Donald said tonight, and he talked about those um, gaps and, and silence gaps, and he talked about it uh, as a bridge. Uh, and um, I, I thought that was very meaningful. And to think about trying to make a connection that bridges do, we're trying to, to you know, circumvent a river or, a, a, you know, whatever it might be. But also started thinking that th those silences and those gaps can be gates, uh, and that gate swings both ways. Um, and so it's it's also onus on my, the onus on me to to make a change and to listen and um, it's not just um, you know trying to win uh, you know we, we're talking about being opponents uh, you know some of these conversations you don't want to win it's that's not the point of it um, so just that idea and, and I thought that bridge uh, you know idea was wonderful but then I started thinking about that gate aspect of it too so it, it always is going to come back uh, on me to be um, part of that solution as well. I'm totally using that bridges and gates. I just want you all to know I will be using that. <laughs>
I like the concept of gates, I mean, as well. That's awesome. And, you know, that silence is good. I think <laughs> the quiet one, the silence is good. It's reflective times. But let me, <laughs> let me think about this, you know? Yeah, and sometimes that that's silence is, is awkward, and it, and it doesn't have to be. Uh, right. You know, it, it is awkward, mm -hmm. um, but you can make what it is. And, and you can say, hey, you know, this is a time where I know we're both being reflective. And we may we may need to stop at this point mm -hmm. uh, right. as well too. So mm -hmm. sometimes those silences give us an opportunity to step back and say, "Hey, let's continue this maybe at another time if we have to." Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Next. Did everyone share? Yes. All right. I think so. Yeah. Since we are talking about silence, though, I will tell you one little story from my childhood. Um, my mom is a talker, and I am not, <laughs> surprisingly, here. Maybe that doesn't come off, but I'm not a talker. Um, and she used to just rattle on, and one day she said, I just looked at her, and I said, Mom, silence is golden. And she, <laughs> like, never forgot it. But anyway, so yes, also golden in conversations. <laughs> Yes, we will be uh, strategically uh, utilizing and applying silence um, and giving the conversation room to breathe. Uh, so now we'll open it up for our participant reflections. Um, so just a few things before we open up. We'll take the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, participants will be able to share their reflections with us. Uh, however, I do ask just to protect your privacy uh, for the participants that are on the call. Um, if you have any personal stories or reflections that you would like to share about your workplace, um, I only ask that you please speak with me offline uh, about those reflections and conversations. I have my email here, um, niger.thomas at fultoncountyga.gov. So you and I can kind of step back and, and ensure that your privacy is protected uh, and, and share those conversations one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so for the group and our participants, uh, the three questions that you have uh, to choose from in which you'll share your reflections are one, what was most meaningful and valuable to you in this conversation? What new learning or understanding will come around that you find on this topic? And is there a next step that you would like to take based on the conversation that you heard from us sharing today? So I'll open it up. Um, are there any comments in the chat? From my participants. Nigel, sometimes Nigel, sometimes we're having a hard time hearing you. I don't know if it's a microphone issue for you. Oh, okay. Hold All on. Right. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's a lot better now. Thank you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any comments in chat? Uh, I, I've actually there's one nice comment that I want to read out came from uh, Valerie Dixon, and I'm going to read it because I think it's very very. Uh, it's something that she talks about. She says, "My hopes for the world, my community is for people." to realize we all feel hurt and want the best for our loved ones. One day for the populace to understand that at the end of this life, your ethnic background, gender wealth is what matters. So mm. that's what her comment, and that's what her comment is. And uh, I think basically, um, I, I guess uh, from what I understand from that is at the end of the day, it, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity or background is. It's ultimately what your aspirations are. And, and by and large, most people's aspirations and goals for themselves and their family remains the same. Everybody wants a better tomorrow. Everybody wants to have the American dream, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, while trying to get the American dream, we all sometimes get into a tizzy and it becomes a nightmare. And that's the part that uh, we got to realize that sometimes we got to take that pause and, and, and sit back and be contemplative and, and say, okay, how do we get there? And how do we, how do we achieve it without getting completely bent out of shape? Yeah. And I think that'll set us up very nicely for the next dialogue when we begin to talk about the uh, Martin Luther King speech and the other America. And so we begin to understand what's happening underneath that and what gives um, everybody the sense of kind of the American dream or the American nightmare, depending on kind of where you sit and where you are in the experience. So I think that's a, a Valerie's thoughts are a, a nice segue into that next dialogue for sure. 
Yeah, and talking about, uh, you know, current day politics, um, you know, I, I read what somebody said, you know, there is no liberal judge or a conservative judge. There's only a good judge or a bad judge. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, uh, we sometimes tend to, you know, lean into belief that a different uh, occupation like a Supreme Court justice is supposed to be a political thing. But uh, more often than not, we forget the, all, all the role of a judge of the Supreme Court is to basically make sure that the Constitution is upheld. So, so essentially, uh, you either are a good judge or you're a bad judge. You know, and that's what you're, you should really be because it doesn't matter what background you come, what's your religious affiliation, what your faith is, are you doing your job well? It doesn't matter uh, whether it may go against your personal beliefs, but the question is, are you upholding the Constitution of the United States? And that will apply to almost every, every occupation we are. Are we doing um, what we are paid to do? Uh, with our ways, are we doing something that we think we're doing because of our personal beliefs? Mm. Yes, expanding those personal perspectives and think, thinking of others. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Was there any other reflection? Anything in, in chat? Um, nothing else that I can see, you know. Okay. All right. Did you all have any other reflection you wanted to share before we move into closing? All right. So as we bring our second dialogue to a close, um, I just want to tell everyone here that's listening um, that we value your feedback. Uh, and so we have feedback forms that are available on our I2 website. Um, and we also encourage you to explore livingroomconversations.org and we give the challenge to you uh, to take your family and friends and associates and begin to explore these conversations on your own by visiting the website. Lots of rich material there. Uh, so with that, um, that ends our second dialogue. And I hope that you all join us uh, for our third dialogue, which happens next Thursday. Uh, and we will begin the dialogue of the other America. We'll be exploring uh, Martin Luther King's speech and digging in and, and being very courageous and, and practicing our, our courageous listening uh, as we explore that, uh, that speech next week. So thank you very much. Uh, and with that, um, if there are no other comments, uh, is there anything happening in the chat? I think I just got saw an alert. Was there something that happened in the chat before we sign off? Well, I'm just wondering if Allison uh, has anything to say. I mean, I, I quite enjoyed some of her comments that she made last time, so I don't know whether she's listening, but if you're there, Allison, uh, you know, feel free to send us your comments, your feedbacks, yeah. because we learn every time. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you all so much, my, my dear Dialogue colleagues, uh, and I look forward to seeing you all here again next week. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank, Thank you, you for the participants. Thank you all so much. Thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you. I'll Bye. see you Bye. next week. See, see you next week. Good meeting, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good night.